Every two years, people who've gotten organ transplants get together for an inspiring week with people who've donated kidneys and with people whose loved ones have passed on and donated organs. And they do something amazing. They compete in the Transplant Games of America. I think it, it epitomizes the competitive nature of transplant patients and how they prove to themselves and prove to others that not much has changed. That's kidney transplant recipient, J.P. Marzano. And I'm Monica Fox, kidney recipient, Director of Outreach and Government Relations for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois, and your host for this special episode of The Journey Continues. I'm in sunny San Diego, California for the 2022 Transplant Games, where I caught up with one busy guy, Bill Ryan, the game's CEO. It's a busy day and it's been a busy week, but seeing the smiles on everybody's faces and having, having people talk about how great it is to get back together with their friends and you know new friends and family has been pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about the history of the Transplant Games of America. Okay, well, you know, the Transplant Games have been around since 1990. You know, they, they were started by a former company that now is called Novartis. So Novartis has been the run on the games for, you know, a number of years. We took the games over from the Kidney Foundation in 2011 and have been running them ever since. Um, so, you know, it, it's a rich history. Every two years, the games go on somewhere and thousands of recipients and donor families and now living donors all get together to celebrate the gift of life. That's just awesome. And um, what's the main purpose of the Transplant Games of America? Well, you know, some of the things that are, are kind of obvious. We have 100, roughly 106,000 people in the United States on the donor registry waiting for an organ. And uh, 17 to 18 people die every day because an organ was not available. So first and foremost, we view our role is to enlighten the world and make sure they understand that there are people that are waiting for an organ and, and need them desperately. So that's first and foremost. Secondly, uh, it's a way for us to honor, you know, uh, deceased donors and living donors who have made a sacrifice and given and given either through, uh, you know, uh, in passing have given organs up or through living donation uh, have made life available for somebody else. So, uh, so we're excited about that. And then and then to honor the recipients in the, in the medical medical miracle of transplantation. It surely is a miracle, and uh, it's great to be able to get back together um, in person after the pandemic caused some problems. So we we had a little bit of a lapse in between uh, 2018 and this year. Yeah, we sure have, and uh, and everybody we did a pretty good job on the virtual games uh, in 20. It ended up being 2021, but but I think they, they went off as well as you could expect, but it's not the same. It's not the same as looking at people in their eyes and seeing their smiles and getting a hug. And uh, it just, uh, it's a different experience in, in, in our family, our community, that's really important. Yes, and sharing the stories um, between recipients and donor families is a major part of it, especially for me as a recipient. I really enjoy have an opportunity to meet up with other donor families and share my gratitude with them for their precious gift that they've given yeah. and to help in that healing process. Well, and you know, I'm a donor dad. Yes. Um, and so the games give me an opportunity to honor my daughter who made a donation and made life possible for others. So it gives me a warm feeling inside on a day-to-day -day basis to, to know that she's really here in spirit. Absolutely, and that she will live on forever. Yep. And uh, through the, especially through this powerful work that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, it's really, it's really wonderful. What have been some of the challenges in coming back together? Because even though COVID really isn't over, you have gathered here a lot of immune-compromised people. Or did you find that challenging, or how did you, 
how did you guys approach that? Well, you know, as we think we are one of the leading advocacy groups for transplant patients, caregivers, and donor families. So we have a unique relationship, I think, with that within our community. And when COVID first hit, we were very early on gathering information to communicate to our family members, our community about COVID and where they could go for information. So we caught on pretty early with the, you know, the people that in, in the government. So we, we were able to latch on and get, they considered us insiders. You know, we were, we were get, given information. And so we were able to kind of adapt and learn and help with our audience and how to treat and how to work through the issues with COVID. But you know, the bottom line is our people are immuno, immunocompromised every day has nothing to do with COVID. Correct. So we, we think our members are more aware of the things they need to do to stay healthy and not get infected, regardless of whether it's COVID or any other disease. So so we think we, we've got the pattern down. We think we know how to live our life. And so I think uh, our group does a better job than most. Well, I know that there's a lot of competing going down, <laughs> going on down there and lots of medals being given and people really feel proud of what they're able to accomplish here and it really um, encourages recipients to live a long that they can live a long healthy life um, by staying active like this so so i'm really grateful to you for that so the question that's going around town and i'm just going to ask it here right now <laughs> because maybe i'll get some breaking news or something where's the next game's going to be held at you know we i think there's there's been a rumor going around that we're going to announce the 2024 site uh tonight at the farewell reception but the reality is uh that the site has not been selected yet so uh, we're still in the process of analyzing some of the bids and taking a look at it. I mean, we're trying to be very careful and cost conscious. You know, we've been on the West Coast twice now we, in 2018 and, and now in 2022. So it's a pretty much a foregone conclusion, although not necessarily true that it's likely we'll head back Midwest or South, you know, um, and we're looking at bids now. But, but we haven't made any selection, so. So um, what are you most looking forward to as you continue to run the Transplant Games of America? Any, um, you have any new innovative things coming up or? Well, you know, the foundation, aside from the games, also publishes Transplant Nation magazine. So uh, that's one of our, our jewels. Uh, it's a 68 page magazine that's printed six times a year. Uh, I tell people it's the, the People magazine for the transplant community. My staff doesn't like that because they, you know, they think it's a little higher level than that. But I, but I do think it serves the community in the same way. There's stories about you know, our, their people's lives and their experience with donation and transplantation. There's stories about healthy living. There's stories about innovative things that are going on in the in the medical world with transplant talks about policy things, things that are happening in the government. And and there's picture photo spreads of people sharing their hearts and their other organs. And uh, so it's it's really a a great magazine. The last thing that, you know, one of our initiatives is we kind of uh, work and lead the Transplant uh, Community Coalition, which is a a group of like-minded organizations that address the needs of the transplant community. One of the things that we're working on right now is trying to develop more programs in the multicultural community. We know that we need to do a better job in the multicultural community. We need more organs, uh, more people willing to donate within minority communities across the country. And we also know that there's a tremendous need for patients in the minority community to get organs. So that's our that's our initiative right now. We're working with NMAG, which is the Natural Multicultural Action Group, you know, that's part of, uh, you know, Donate Life America. And it's a tough market. If you want to call it a market, it's a tough market to to do business in, but we're we're going to continue to try till we get it right. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. I'm happy to do that, Monica. You take care.
Next, I'm talking to Alexandra Flaxman. She's here working on behalf of CareDX, the presenting sponsor for the games. Alex is also a two-time kidney transplant recipient. Hey, Alex. So tell me your story and uh, why you're here at the transplant games. Okay, so my story uh, in a nutshell is I was born with kidney disease and um, I went on dialysis at a very young age of eight um, and that was traumatizing as an eight-year-old to, you know, absolutely go on dialysis and not do all the things that other kids are doing and not eat the same things at sleepovers and, you know, just all of that. Um, so I was on dialysis for a little over two years when I finally got uh, my first kidney transplant uh, when I was 11 um, at UCSD and finally got to feel like a real kid again, you know, got to join the dance team, got to, you know, go to the mall with my friends, not have to worry about can't eat that, don't do this. Um, but then I became a teenager and being a teenager is hard for anybody. It's extra hard for girls and it's extra hard when you are a girl with a chronic illness and needing to manage all of the things that you need to do post-transplant. Um, so particularly for me, it was very hard to adhere to my medication regimen. You know, prednisone does not make a 16-year-old girl feel good about herself. Uh, so I stopped taking my meds because um, I just didn't understand why other kids didn't have to do this. And it wasn't really, you know, an intentional situation that happened. It would be, you know, you're at a sleepover and you forget because you're human and then you wake up and you still feel okay and you're like, oh, maybe it's not a big deal. And then it would happen again and again, but you know it's wrong, so you don't tell anybody because you don't want to get in trouble. Um, and eventually it caught up with me and I lost my kidney when I was 18 and I went back on dialysis. And I fell into a very bad place emotionally and mentally and it was really hard to get over that hump. Um, but I had a situation happen where my, my care team at the time was not very patient centric and it really forced me to either just give up or stand up for myself and advocate for myself. And because I had a great support system and great parents who raised me well, I decided to advocate for myself and advocate for better care. And that's really when I became the patient advocate that I am today. I got very involved with the National Kidney Foundation and you know it really became my mission to create a community that didn't exist when I was a kid and to provide hope and inspiration and just what it looks like when you get over that hump and that even if you make mistakes because mistakes happen you're not the alone and you can get through it and you know there there is a better side to things. So I finally, you know, got my act together. I started getting healthy. I started, you know, getting mentally healthy, which was really, really important. And in May of 2013, I finally got my second kidney transplant, um, May 18th. And so that was nine years ago, this May. So that was, that's- Congratulations. That's, thank you. It's a huge milestone. Um, for me, you know, my first kidney lasted seven years and 10 months. So for me, I was like, I just need to get farther than that. Yes. So with every day that goes by beyond seven years and 10 months is, <laughs> is a huge win. Um, so when I finally got my transplant, the second one, and you know, <clears throat> I was in my late twenties, I was still figuring out who I was because I spent a lot of, you know, all of my twenties mostly on dialysis. I was like, what do I do next? How do I keep giving back? I didn't want to just step away from the community now that I was healthy. I wanted to, to keep going. Uh, and that's when I got introduced to CareDX, um, which is a post-transplant surveillance company. Um, and we specialize in care for post-transplant for heart, kidney, and lung. And I just kind of became like a patient ambassador for them. Um, just, you know, spreading the word of who they were in the community. And when COVID happened in 2020, and all transplant patients, all immunocompromised 
patients, you know, we really were far more secluded than everyone else. Uh, Cardiac started doing uh, webinars to really try and keep the transplant community together safely apart. So I got involved um, helping them out with some of those and fast forward two years and now I'm community engagement manager there and I oversee a lot of our patient resources and education and initiatives, which brings us here to the Transplant Games where Cardiax is the presenting sponsor. And for me, it's really amazing because San Diego is my hometown and that's where the games are this year. So it's very full circle moment. Totally full circle. Um, My first coordinator ever, Dina McDonald, is here with Rady's Children's and I haven't seen her in forever. And so for her to see me here is, you know, very emotional. Wow, I can imagine that reunion. It was, it was, I mean, she still looks exactly the same. I, she thinks I still look exactly the same, but I'm like, there's <laughs> no way, you know. Um, and just to see all of, you know, of, of you guys, you know, you and I have known each other for so long, but we haven't seen each other in person in like three years. And yes, seeing patients that I've met virtually over the last two years, getting to meet them for the first time and meeting new patients and new donor families and living donors and just celebrating the gift of life that is transplant and what that does for someone has been so inspirational even for me as someone that you know lives eats and breathes transplant to have this outlook like I really need to step up my game as a transplant patient like all these people that are competing and like all of these events and I'm like I need to get up off my couch and off my computer and (laughs) Start practicing for 2024. Absolutely, yeah. So the competitions are amazing. And um, you're here working, but next time you'll be back as an athlete too, huh? Yes, next (laughs) next time I'll be back as working and as an athlete. Haven't figured out what my sports are going to be, but I'm I'm really excited to participate. Yeah, I think it's great that that we have this opportunity to show that um, transplant recipients can live healthy active life mm-hmm. lives no definitely i th- yeah. you know i think there's this misconception that like we're fragile and we can't do everything that everyone else can do but anybody that spent five minutes watching basketball the other night would be mistaken absolutely it was a fight to the finish it was it was like jesus it's like the professionals and the ballroom dancing it's like watching dancing with the stars i mean this is very serious event and it's just beautiful to see everyone here just supporting each other and yes we're competing and everyone's excited when they win a medal but at the end of the day we're just happy to be alive absolutely absolutely and especially after all this time with the pandemic where we were so afraid by being immunocompromised and the the impact that covid had on some of us yes and could have had uh you know, much more devastating effects mm-hmm. so that we're all here yeah. is wonderful. Yes. Yeah. yeah. COVID has been a challenge for everybody, but especially for transplant recipients. Yes. Well, I thank you for all that you're doing to advocate for us and to keep the education coming from CareDX. Keep up the great work. Next, I'll be speaking with donor dad, Peter Kupsack. He's a donor family member here at the Transplant Games of America. Hi, Peter. Hello. How are you? you? Great. Tell me about um, yourself and why you're here at the Games. Okay. So uh, I've been attending the Games since 2004. So uh, I guess this makes it our 10th game. And uh, I'm a donor dad. My daughter, Jessica Marie, gave the gift of life on November 23rd to two men and two women in Queens, New York. Uh, Jessica was 24 years old and she suffered a severe asthma attack and she was on life support for seven days. Jessica was a registered organ donor in New York and um, unfortunately the attack was so severe um, her brain stem hemorrhaged or herniated on the 23rd and that's when the process began. Um, She was my only child, and uh, coming to the Games in 2004 was 
a real healing experience for me. Mm, it was tell a, me about that. Well, you know, um, I got to tell you, I was uh, single at the time. I'd just gone through my second divorce. It wasn't Jessica's mom. Um, and I was functional, but I spent a lot of time in the bottle during those two years. And, um, but going to the games was truly healing for me. Um, I met so many recipients that just took me on, you know, as, you know, you know, you're, you're, you're not my donor family, but you are now. And everybody uh, uh, showed me so much love and care and uh, watched out for me. Um, and I've been sold on it and I've committed myself to uh, attending the games as long as I'm healthy, promoting organ and tissue and asthma awareness um, where and when and wherever possible. I talk to schools, I talk to police departments, union meetings, fire departments, and I, uh, I'm just committed to this cause. I'm with Team Liberty because Jessica was living in New York. I actually live in Connecticut okay. with my wife. I actually met my wife at the 2004 games. So uh, we've been together, together ever since. We got married and, you know, I would give anything to have my daughter back. And all of us would as donor families. Absolutely. But, you know, it, it's just not possible. But uh, meeting all these recipients and becoming part of the transplant donor family community has been very, very rewarding. And I'm glad to share my story at any time. And sharing your story, it um, certainly gives hope to others. It's beautiful that um, coming to the games has been a healing process Absolutely. Uh, for you. And as a as a donor, as a recipient myself, I am truly grateful to you for the gift that you've given um, and for what you continue to do, because this community would not be what it is without donor families like yourself. So thank I am you. so grateful to you for all that and you do. You. And I'm so, and, I, and, and, and it's wonderful to see you. You know, you're seven years out. Yes. You know. And my actually, my date of um, donation is November 23rd. No way. 2016. No yeah. way. Yeah. What a coinkadink that yeah. is. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. You know, the games are wonderful. I encourage everybody who can come and participate. Um, you know, and it's just a, it's a, it's a healing. I can't tell you the healing that goes on here. I, you know, I, I, I consider myself lucky that Jessica was able to donate. She is alive. I've yes. met the heart recipient after 16 years and he's been able to see his grandchildren. He's been able to walk his daughter down the aisle. That's so to, beautiful. To watch his kids graduate from high school and college. And he's very healthy. And it's 20 years that he's had Jessica's heart. That's beautiful. And Jessica lives on. She does. She does. Well, thank you for keeping her alive. You're very welcome. And for being here with us and for sharing that story with us. Thank you so much for asking me to speak on, about Jessica because that... It's always here. Okay. Thank right. you, Peter. Thank you. Next, I'm speaking with donor mom, Cindy Grobmeyer. Cindy, tell me about uh, yourself and why you're here at the Transplant Games. I'm a donor mom. We lost our daughter, Maddie, in 2019, and she was able to... Uh, she was able to be an organ and tissue donor, and so we've gotten very involved in the in the donation and transplant community. And my husband Frank and I, uh, this is our first games. This is our first time here, and uh, we we came both to attend and to learn what the games were all about. And we also uh, came here representing our nonprofit organization. Um, and so, yeah, this has been an, it's been an incredible week. It's been overwhelming in a in a good way <laughs> awesome tell me about your nonprofit organization so we actually um, we have two we have the mad dog strong foundation which is uh, named after our daughter Maddie uh, whose nickname was mad dog and she lived up to that name and we were here because we've partnered with um, an author who happens to also be a works for Indiana donor network 
who is working on producing a documentary series. And so we're his fiscal sponsor, as our nonprofit is his fiscal sponsor. So we came here to promote that here to this audience at the Games. And then we've also worked with a group of donor families from around the country to start an organization, a virtual organization called the Donor Family Care Network. And so we introduced that to the donor families here at the Games as well. Oh, that is fantastic. And tell me, why was your daughter called Mad Dog? <laughs> the short story is um, Frank. Frank's a big baseball guy. And when she was just a baby, he was holding her. And she's this little petite little baby. And then, boy, but when she when she cried, she let out a roar. And it reminded him of a pitcher um, named Greg Mad Dog Maddis, Maddox, who was this unassuming guy with glasses and and but boy when he got angry he he let out a roar and so that was where maddie maddie got the nickname mad dog and it stuck with her her entire life awesome and maddie was also um an athlete wasn't she she was a competitive gymnast uh she was actually she passed away uh the day after her 18th birthday Uh, she had just graduated high school and she was getting ready to continue her gymnastics career at the university of wisconsin lacrosse Mm. yeah and so with her being an athlete, I would imagine that being here at the Transplant Games would be something she might have enjoyed. Oh, she would have loved this. Uh, she would have had so much fun watching all the events and participating in what she could. And you know, she was just one of the, being a gymnast, any any sport she tried, she could do. She just really didn't like any of them except gymnastics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> And gymnastics just is mind-boggling to me, (laughs) how people can do the things they do with their body. It was mind-boggling to us, too. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So what do you, um, as a donor mom, how does it make you feel to be here and see all of these transplant recipients competing against each other in all these various sports like basketball and volleyball and um it's track ins- and field. It's inspiring. I mean, it is inspiring because, you know, until we until we had this all happen, I didn't know transplant recipients could could do those kinds of things. And just to see, you know, I, I saw a picture of one holding a bicycle over his head after he finished the bicycle race, and it's just it's unbelievable. And the recipients are. We were warned that it was going to be a lot and that the, the appreciation is, is, is incredible. But, wow, I, I never imagined that there would be so many just kind. The kindness and the, the love has just been amazing it, from every recipient we've met. It's been incredible. Yes. So as a recipient, I love every donor family that I meet and I'm so grateful for the gift that your family has given um, to this community. And then you continue to give by being involved with your OPO and starting other organizations to benefit others. It is just really such a gift that keeps on giving. This community has given us a gift. I, I don't know where we'd be without you know donation in this community in our journey, but it's definitely helped us too. It's and and we try that's what we try to communicate to people is that you know if you have the opportunity to share your loved one after they've passed it it continues to give you that gift back just time and time again yes so maddie lives on and she will always live on in your heart in our hearts and in everyone who knows her story. And we get to keep telling that story, which is what's amazing. Yes, and we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Finally, I'm speaking with kidney transplant recipient and multiple medal winner, J.P. Marzano. Tell me why you're here at the Transplant Games of America. I am here to compete in sporting events to celebrate my transplants, the people that gave them to me, to see people that have been in the same situation and just enjoy the camaraderie that exists within the games. Okay, tell me about your transplants. What transplants have you had? I've had three kidneys. Uh, my first one was in 1994, the second was in 1999, and the third one was in 2007. All of my donors are living, still living. My father, one of my dear friend's mothers, was basically like a mother to me, mm-hmm. um, and another dear friend from high school. 
what a gift. Three gifts. Three gifts. Yes. And so you have, how long have you been coming to the games? My first games was in 1996 um, in Salt Lake City. I was a part of the original spare parts basketball team. We lost in the final, and it's still a, uh, a legendary game for <laughs> uh, non-basketball reasons. Um, <laughs> but uh, my next games were in 2010, so I had quite a hiatus for various reasons, and then I've been coming to every games, every, every one since Madison in 2010. Awesome. So basketball is really competitive here at uh, the Transplant Games of yeah. America, huh? It's, uh, I think it, it epitomizes the competitive nature of transplant patients and how they, they have something to uh, prove to themselves and prove to others that there's really not, not much has changed physically in them other than maybe a, a scar or a, a fistula or something like that and and you know the, the drugs in certain ways they have their their side effects and they can slow you down a little bit a lot of people they, this is this is how they push themselves to show that they're continuing to, to live their life hopefully just as well and just as competitive as they did before their surgery yeah sounds like it um what other sports do you compete in I've done various others depending on the location of uh, the games. I did bocce back in Cleveland, which was great because I used to play that with my grandfather when I was a kid. Tennis, um, I've done racquetball, which is no longer. Um, I haven't seen it, actually. This is my second games doing pickleball, which is becoming a very popular uh, event here. Table tennis, which I figured with all my basement ping pong <laughs> matches when I was a kid that I'd have, but there's... There's some guys that are really good. Um, I played basketball. I played volleyball. That's about it. How many medals have you won over the years? I have lost them. <laughs> I so have um, lots. I have them hung up. Uh, my mother had had framed the first two that I won back in Salt Lake City, but I've um, I've hung them up. Uh, uh, to me, the best part for me, I love when the the donor family hands them out. Yeah. Um, I know that it's. It's a it's a connection for them, so it's, it's, that's neat. Uh, but yeah, I'm I don't know. <laughs> so, what's the best part of participating in the Transplant Games of America for you? The people, I think, the stories that you hear, the celebratory ones, the sad ones, the ones that are full of spirit. I think the the, or the, the stories from the games that epitomize um, embody the spirit of the games, and there's. I mean, every single every single games has stories that they're tear jerkers. They're they give you goosebumps, um, and I still tell certain ones that I've heard to people that don't know what they're like. But tell me what it's like. Yes. Um, there was a story from Grand Rapids that's still to me the best story of the games, and that was the first ones under TGA. Mm-hmm. And I don't think there was a dry eye in the in the cozy ceremonies. What and was the story? The um, should I tell it? Yes. I'll try and go quick. There was, and I'll try not to get the waterworks for mm-hmm. That was, it was the kids group. Um, I don't know how old they were. They're all between 7 and 12 maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little bit younger. Um, doing the 100 yard dash and there's four of them. And they all line up and you notice that one of the kids carrying his oxygen tank. He's got his mask. He's doing a 100-yard dash. And the gun goes off, and they all run down. The, the, but the, the kid with the mask is barely walking. He's just kind of a, a little trot, and he's waving to the audience, the crowd, and everyone's cheering for him. And he gets all the way down to the end, and the first kid had crossed, and the second kid had crossed, and the third kid stopped about a couple feet from the, from the, the finish line and let the kid go by him and get the bronze medal. Oh. And that is, that's about everything that, and that, everything you can encompass about these games all into one simple story. And the fact that, you know, it was a kid. You can't, you can't teach that. And I think a lot of people can learn something from that in terms of sportsmanship-wise because there's yes. been some unfortunate <laughs> issues that have happened over the years. I think I heard some sniffles from my dad. You know, it's just, it's yeah. just it's hard not to 
to soak that in. And um, at a lot of the team meetings we had for Illinois, um, I would bring that up to people that were new to the new to all of this. And but I mean, you know, you see these quilts over here, and you um, you you learn about the people that gave their organs, and there's all the stories, and, and some are tragic. It's it's awful. Yes. Um, and how the donor family members are here to just I can't I don't know what that's like I can't I'm not on that side of the table right um, but when you're when you have um, from the donor families that I have met they've asked me like what should I expect I'm like just have an open mind and then let me know when you're done and yeah. we'll see and almost all of them it's like you just soak it in and if you need to laugh you laugh if you need to cry you cry and if you need to you know <clears throat> a hug then you go hug someone and that's yeah. what this is about so definitely well thank you thank you for sharing your story and your wonderful history with the Transplant Games of America and I hope that you and I have many more opportunities to come here together and compete absolutely alright hopefully thanks. when they figure out where the next games are <laughs> <laughs> Some people find it hard to believe that organ recipients and living donors can live a long, healthy life with one kidney or spare parts, as we affectionately call them. Well, as you've heard here, it's true. If you'd like to get involved with the Transplant Games of America and you live in Illinois, contact info at goteamillinois.org. And outside of Illinois, contact transplantgamesofamerica.org. I'm Monica Fox, and this is the journey continues. Prevention is a key part of our mission at NKFI. That's why at the end of each episode, Dr. Melissa Prest offers a health tip. Here's today's health tip about exercise and physical activity. Everyone can benefit from moving their bodies daily. 30 to 60 minutes a day of some form of activity is recommended for its health benefits. Exercise has been shown to help with weight management and combat health conditions and diseases like heart disease, high blood pressure, strokes, diabetes, arthritis, depression, and anxiety. Exercise can increase your energy level, promote better sleep, and can actually be fun. Your exercise routine should include a variety of movement that gets your heart rate up and encourages you to use your muscles. Flexibility is also important so that you can move your joints through a full range of motion. Walking, jogging, jumping rope, climbing stairs, hiking, riding a bike, swimming, and rowing are exercises that get your heart pumping. Lifting weights or using exercise bands can be a great way to strengthen your muscles. And yoga or tai chi movements are great at increasing your flexibility. Whenever starting an exercise program, talk with your healthcare provider to discuss which types of exercises are most appropriate for you. Start slow and gradually increase your time and intensity. While 30 to 60 minutes a day is the recommendation, start where you can. Maybe it's 10 minutes a day and continue to work until you get to the goal of 30 to 60 minutes. Always pay attention and listen to your body. If you feel dizzy, faint, or ill, stop exercising and follow up with your provider. With today's health tip, I'm Melissa Prest, a registered dietitian nutritionist and the foundation dietitian for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. The Journey Continues is brought to you by the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois and sponsored by Donate Life Illinois. To learn more about kidney disease and living donation, visit www.nkfi.org. To register to become an eye, tissue, and organ donor, visit lifegoeson.com. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please subscribe to and leave a review for The Journey Continues in Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. This podcast is produced by Rivet. To hear more great podcasts, visit rivet360.com.